Open up your Bibles with me, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going Old Testament today. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. I'm gonna read about eight verses. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse three through five. I'm actually gonna read that first because um, uh, it's gonna kind of help set the tone uh, for this new series that we're gonna jump in. So uh, we're gonna do a series of talks uh, uh, for the next four weeks called Mind Games. Mind Games. Come on, uh, anybody uh, ever in here, you, you, you've had some mind games going on? I'll, I'll wait for you to raise your hand. I'll wait for you to raise your hand. Okay, cool, yeah. Come on, you, you got some mind games. You, you got some things going on up here. Come on, any of you, you you've ever uh, gotten in a fight with somebody else, but they weren't there, but you were in your shower debating both sides of the argument? Come on, come on, you're up in the shower and you're like, well, yeah, what have you thought about? You know, and, and can I tell you, I am undefeated in those arguments. I've never lost one of those arguments uh, when I'm in the shower and I'm point, counterpoint, and, and I'm, do, I'm, I'm undefeated uh, in those. I, I call those, like that is the fruit of mind games. When you start talking to people and debating people that aren't even there, you are in the midst of a mind game. Uh, and so that's really what I wanna preach on. I, I, think, we've, um, I think we've been in a season um, where we've all been left to our own thoughts. And sometimes that's been good and other times it's been scary. And, uh, and that's what I wanna preach on today. And so we're, we're gonna start with a mind game um, that, that I think all of us to varying degrees um, have played. And, um, and, and again, it's, it, I, we're gonna start out, it's, it's kind of a heavy one today, I gotta be honest, it's kind of a heavy one today, I'm still gonna do my best to make it laugh a little bit, but, but, uh, but it's kind of a heavy one, I wanna be honest, because I think it's an important one that we have to navigate. And, and, and here's the title of my message, here's the first mind game we're gonna get into, is what if, I wasn't here. What if I wasn't here? And for some of you, that's a very literal phrase. For some of you, you have had the mind game, the, the literal mind game of what if I literally wasn't here on earth? And, and, and you've been in that battle. Some of you, man, you, you, you navigate severe depression and you've been in that battle. Some of you, it might not be literal, it might be more figur figurative. It, it might be, what if I wasn't in this marriage? And what if I wasn't in this job? And you've created a bad habit of going from workplace to workplace to workplace, thinking that some work environment is going to fulfill you, even though a work environment was never created to fulfill you. Oh, what if I wasn't in this relationship? What if I wasn't in this friendship? What if I wasn't in this family? What if I, it, 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 we've all had this mind game of what if I wasn't here? And I wanna read out of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse three through five, it reads like this. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion based, uh, every opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And then here's the ticket, and take every thought captive until it obeys Christ. And then in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse one, I wanna, I wanna set the stage a little bit. Um, the main character in this story is a man named Elijah. Now, Elijah is the greatest prophet of his day. In fact, he, before this verse, has just got done taking on 450 prophets of Baal. And, and, and what Elijah says is he, is he shows up on the scene and he, he says, he uses this term, I, I could preach a whole message on just this term, but he says this, he goes, man, when are you gonna stop limping along? When are you gonna stop limping along? You need to choose today who you're gonna serve, either the God of Israel or the gods of Baal. And so he challenges the, 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 these prophets of Baal and, and he challenges them and he said, hey, we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna have a sacrifice and you're gonna have a sacrifice. I'm gonna sacrifice to my God, you're gonna sacrifice to your God. And then we're gonna see which God shows up. The story goes that, right, the only God shows up. The God of Israel shows up and, and the, the prophets of Baal are humiliated and not just are they humiliated, but their lives are taken from them. And, and so, so uh, Elijah has just really won this unbelievable victory. And then we pick it up in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse one. It reads like this, right? Because this is how life goes. This is the roller coaster of life. It says, when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way that he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. The Bible says Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. 
Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and he slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So we got up and ate and drank, and I love this. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Come on, let's pray together today over the preaching of God's word. God, ah, better is one day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. God, we're grateful for your house today, Lord. God, I, I pray that you would cover our mind with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray you'd give us strength as we fight the mind games cover our thinking so that it promotes what you think towards us. God, we love you. We need you. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Amen. Well, um, uh, one, one of the great joys of my job, one, one of the great joys that I've had uh, in ministry over the last 16 years is meeting with various people over various things. It's really one of the great joys that I get to do is to, is to meet with people and talk with people through life, life issues, life things. And, and I love uh, you know, giving the best counsel I can give. And, and, and I love hearing about you know, the amazing things in people's life. I, I love hearing, um, and, and I love, and I count it an honor that I get to be with people during the difficulties of life. Um, however, I can always tell when I'm in a meeting that I don't necessarily think that that person set up the meeting. Like, and I can always tell when I'm meeting um, with a husband whose wife was like, hey, if you don't meet with pastor, something bad will happen, okay? Like, I, I can always tell when I'm meeting with a young person whose parents were like, hey, we're done paying for college until you meet with pastor. Like, I can always tell when someone doesn't really wanna be in the room, right? And these are always fascinating meetings. Because sometimes, in fact, I've had this happen on more than one occasion. Somebody will come in. Now, in some ways, I kind of understand it, and you might be able to relate to it, too. Somebody will come in, and they'll go, hey, you know, I I'm here, you know, because so-and-so said we should meet. But, but he he here's what I don't want. I don't want any cliches. Like, like I, I, I don't want any pastor speak. I don't want any, like, you know, like, faith talk. I I'm just here so I don't get fined. I'm just here, just, just out of Marshawn Lynch reference. I'm just here, uh, uh, you, know, you know, just because you know, so-and-so wanted me to come here, and I don't want any cliches. And, and I can kind of understand them because we've all had that kind of moment where it's like, you know, we, we just don't like, naturally, we don't like cliches. But what have I told you today, today that that thing that you think is a cliche is actually the key that could unlock something in your life? What if that thing that you quickly dismiss as a cliche is actually the very words that you need into your soul that can shape the way that you're thinking so that you can get out of your life everything that God wants to get out of your life? So when I'm in these kind of meetings, this is literally what I do is I'll go, okay, because I want to honor the person I'm talking to. And, and, and so I, I go, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here to listen. And I will literally listen. Now, this is hard for me to do because I got a lot of thoughts and a lot of opinions. It's very difficult for me to do, but, but, but I've, I've, I've learned the secret of how to do it. And I will sit there and I will let this person talk. I will give no positive feedback. I will give no encouragement. I will give no cliche because I'm afraid no matter what I say, it's gonna be a cliche. And so I'll sit there and I'll listen to them and I'll let them just like talk and I'll let them talk. And where it always goes is it inevitably goes to the place where they're just like asking themselves a bunch of questions. Well, well, man, how come I didn't do that? And how come I didn't do this? And how come I'm not more like them? And how come that, uh, uh, you know, like, like all, all the, and, and they will get to this point where they're just asking themselves question after question after question. And I thought, man, there's something that I could say right now that I think could be helpful, but you already told me you probably think it's a cliche. In, in fact, I wanna give you the definition of a cliche. This is the Webster's definition of cliche. This is what it is. A phrase or opinion that is overused and betrays a lack of original thought. 
That's what a cliche is. Is it a phrase or opinion that is overused and betrays a lack of original thought? You know there's a difference between a cliche and the word of God. In fact, I don't even think of cliches in terms of words or phrases. I think of cliches as it pertains to a posture of living. Like, like, like for example, um, midlife crisis for a man, cliche. Right, that, uh, uh, you know, the path, going the path of least resistance, cliche, right? I don't think of words or phrases as cliches, why? Because the Bible says that there is death and life in the power of the words that we speak. And, and, and so what we know is, is that we know that when we listen to the word of God, what we discover, it's not a cliche to know and to, and to discover that God is who he says that he is. See, the reality, this is why I don't like even the word cliche, is because when I need a tool, I just need the right tool. Like, I don't care how many times someone has used that tool for that task. And I don't even care if everybody else would choose the same tool for that task. The question is, is it the right tool? Like if I need a hammer, I'm not like, but would everybody choose a hammer here? Like people been using a hammer for a long time. I, I, I don't know. Maybe the reason why people have been using a hammer for a long time and maybe why everybody else would pick a hammer for the same task is because the hammer is effective for that task. You and I gotta be careful that we don't throw things away that could change our life simply because they're overused. In fact, the Bible even says, in fact, Solomon says this, is that there is nothing new under the sun. In, in, in fact, th this whole thing in our culture now where everything has to be uber creative is doing a lot of damage in people's lives because they don't go back to the age old truths that God is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do and they don't just stand on that and go, look, I don't care if it's overused, is it effective? And that's how we have to think. Otherwise, the enemy will get you asking yourself a lot of questions. And you'll be like that person that's in my office and they're just asking themselves questions even though there are real answers to those questions. In, in fact, I, I found in my own life that when I'm asking myself a lot of questions versus making declarations that God has spoken over my life, I get down to some pretty dangerous places. And, and by the way, that's why what if I wasn't here is a dangerous mind game to play. It's a dangerous mind game to play. Because here's why, it minimizes God and it maximizes comfort, which in the end leads to discomfort. So it minimizes God. So when I start asking myself questions like, what if I wasn't here? What if I wasn't in this marriage? What if I wasn't in this marriage? What if I wasn't in this family? What if I wasn't a part? What it does is it causes me to go, man, okay, I'm gonna lean towards comfort. And what it will have people doing is making destructive decisions that lead to ultimate discomfort. It's gonna cause you to walk away from something that God has equipped you for. In fact, here's my point, my only point is this, is that your assignments will always be outmatched by the grace that is on your life. Your assignments, the things that God has called you to carry will always be outmatched by the grace that is on your life. That's a promise from God. The fact that God says, listen, I'm not gonna put anything on your life that I haven't equipped you with the strength to carry. So you don't gotta wonder if you're made for this. You don't gotta wonder if, oh, would I be better off if I left? Would I be better off if I wasn't here? No, no, you are here and I put you in this situation, in this position because I created you for it before the foundations of the world. So if you're there, you can walk through it. And yet here we see Elijah. And by the way, the, the Bible encourages me because like if, if men like Elijah can have moments where they go from the mountaintop experience where they trusted God against 450 other prophets of another God, and, and yet in the very next verse can feel like they're running away for their life. Anybody else, can, can anybody else relate to that? I can, I can relate to that. Come on, high highs, low lows. And it says in 1 Kings 19, it says when Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including how he killed the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. This is a roller coaster of life. We must be careful of the emotional swings that life brings. 
You gotta be careful. In fact, some of the best counsel I ever got in my whole life was don't let your highs be too highs and your lows be too low. We actually have some stewardship capacity in this arena. Because we've all had those moments where even though something couldn't take us out, we thought it could. Like, uh, for me recently, now, I, I, I've changed a little bit during uh, this COVID-19 thing. I, I, I've changed, I, I've, um, I picked up what I called um, uh, the COVID-12. LBs, 12 LBs. That, during the middle of COVID, I was like, okay, I gotta make some adjustments. I, I, I have to change some things up. I have picked up the COVID-12. And, uh, and so I had to make some life changes. And I started making these life changes a couple months ago. Now, now, I have refrained, I have stopped something that I've been doing a very long time. In fact, some of you are gonna be really disappointed in me. I, 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 I've stopped doing something that has been a part of my routine from literally the time I was probably 17 years old. But, but I'm not getting any younger, guys. I'm discovering I'm not getting any younger. I got two kids now. Like, I just, I'm not getting any younger. Um, and now some of you, you're, you're always so gracious. Sometimes you'll get me these for gifts. So you need to stop getting these. So what used to be a blessing is now a get thee behind me, Satan type of moment. And what you need to understand is that um, I officially gave up two months ago Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. I know it's been very difficult on me. It's been, it's been weird. Like my, even, even Justice is like, what's going on, Dad? Like, like, like my kids could sense it. They can feel it in the house. It's, 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 things are different. Um, and uh, so, so, I, so I, stopped, I stopped eating them. Now, here's what I know. I had to replace one snack with another snack. I can't just go no snack. You know what I mean? Like I'm not a monster, you know? And so, so I've, I've been trying to figure out what my nighttime snack is. It's like a, li a little more, more healthy. And, and, and one of these things that, that we had gotten is, um, is like these little icy things, like little Italian ice thing, you know, that you can kind of eat. Now, I, I had these like three days in a row. And now, listen, if you're under like 30 or maybe under 25, you are, I, you're not gonna understand what I'm about to say. But if you're maybe like older than 30 and you've had this kind of moment, has, have any of you, and I need to see hands on this one because I need to make sure I'm not alone. But... Um, uh, have you ever gotten a heartburn and you thought you were gonna die? Like anybody, can, can, can anybody, uh, like, you ever gotten heartburn? So like three nights in a row, I ate these things. And me and Christina are watching a show and I finished it and I said over about 10 minutes later, I'm like, You try to reposition. <laughs> Hope the heartburn falls out of your body. You ever do that? Like, yeah. Christina's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, do we have any Tums? <laughs> Go down, get like a little like glass of milk, a little shot of milk downstairs. And like, I'm like, this heartburn is going to kill me, right? Now, here's the reality. Heartburn's not gonna kill me. But in that moment, it felt like it was gonna kill me. You, you wanna know what's interesting about life? It's not necessarily about what's true, it's about what you believe. Life is about what you believe because what you believe determines how you interpret what is happening around you. And so what you believe, it matters so much. Your beliefs guide your outlook. And so here's an important question for today's message. Does what I believe serve my mental health? Does what I believe serve my mental health? And if not, then I have to change the way that I think so I can change the way that I believe. And all healthy belief cannot exist without inserting Jesus into the equation of your story. All healthy belief will lead us to a place to go, okay, I can tell the story for a little while, but at some point I gotta put Jesus in there. Because that is where healthy belief exists. See, the, the reality is, is, is that we, we need Jesus. In fact, my emotions take me all kinds of places. Listen, you think weird things, like you're strange. Like if you're watching online, I wanna look right in the camera, if you're watching online, you think weird things. Like all of you think weird things. Like if I said, hey, um, tell the person next to you everything you've thought for the last 24 hours, you would have no friends. Nobody would wanna be around you because you think weird things. You'll have, a, you'll have a thought go through your mind and you'll look around and make sure nobody saw you have that thought. <laughs> Everybody's like, man, I think weird 
thing. You have weird thoughts. Like, listen, I, like, I, I, I have, I have in, in fact, if you would have told me at the beginning of this year, hey, uh, Andrew, uh, we're gonna go four months, a third of the year, and not have in-person services for Grace City. Like, like we're gonna go a third of the year and, and, and we, we can't have church in-person gatherings. I would have started crying instantly. I, and I would have been like, no way. No, I would have been like, there's no way. I don't even know how we would survive that. I, 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 I don't know what our church would look like on the other side of that. And you wanna know what's great? Here we are, four months later, it's Jesus' church and he's still building his church and he's still doing what he's doing and he's still in the equation. You gotta stop telling your story without inserting Jesus somewhere in there. Otherwise, it's gonna lead you to, to some really, really dark places. It's, it's kind of like when you see like a bad movie, but you hang with it until the end. You, you ever watch in a movie and you're like, this is pretty terrible, but I paid $72 to see this in the theater. <laughs> Remember those? <laughs> paid $72 to see this movie and, and you're watching the movie and there's always that pivotal moment when you're watching a movie that, that doesn't end well, where it goes to a black screen, but the credits haven't rolled yet. And you start going, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. And the credits roll and you're like, no! That's how it ends? <laughs> you wanna know what we do all the time? I mean, we do this all the time, man. <laughs> we tell the story. We only tell all the bad parts and then we just let the credits roll. We wonder why we don't have the belief and the faith that we so desire. We wonder why we're still playing these head games is because we never get to the place where we go, yeah, but Jesus, Come on, probably so many of you in this room that you thought a season was gonna take you out. I, I don't know a person like older than like 20 that like, like has not had a season that they thought was gonna take them out and yet here they are right now. And by the way, you will have many of those seasons and the thing you will have to reflect upon is going, yeah, but God brought me through that and God brought me through that. And that is the same, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever, and I know he's going to bring me out of this. Refuse to stop the story in the worst possible place. What's interesting is Jezebel puts death in Elijah's heart and in his mind. What does she say? She says, hey, tomorrow you're gonna die. And he believes her. How many people have you believed? Come on, you ever have somebody say something about you? This is like a story of my life. You ever have somebody say something about you and like for some reason you accept it and you didn't care about that person like a week ago? You didn't even know who they were a week ago and they say something and they're like, oh. oh. <laughs> Why are you believing them? Come on, if people are speaking death of your life, I don't care how close they are. Like, like you need to stop believing those people. You need to stop giving your attention. You gotta stop listening to those people. You gotta believe that you are who God says you are. And so, so we know that Elijah believes it because the very next verse is Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life and he goes to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day, and he sat under a solitary broom tree and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Now, um, uh, some of you know this. Um, Christina and I got the vid. <laughs> we got the COVID. Um, uh, a couple, we were actually supposed to open, maybe you might not know that, but we were supposed to open a couple weeks ago. And Christina and I go uh, get tested and, um, and <laughs> surprise, you're pregnant. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> not really, we're not pregnant, but like, you know what I mean, we had the vid. And, um, and, and I was shocked. And, and, and we started noticing some symptoms. We started noticing some symptoms. And uh, the weirdest symptom that we had um, was a loss of taste and smell. That's a real thing. So um, if you had COVID, maybe that happened to you. But like for us, complete loss of taste and smell. And Christina was like, her symptoms were a couple days ahead of me. I mean, literally, I could not taste anything and could not smell anything. Christina's symptoms were about two days before me. And so on one particular occasion, now, just for the people in the room, um, I, I want you to think I'm a good husband. And so I have permission to share this story, okay? Permission was granted by the Christina Guard. I just wanna let you know that. So you're like, oh, I can't believe you're sharing this story. I, permission was granted, okay? And, um, and the first meal that Christina cooked when she could not taste or smell was salmon. Now, I love, my wife's an amazing cook. I love her salmon, I, I, I love her salmon. And so she, um, so she cooks it and, we're, and we're, we're sitting down to eat and um, I took my first bite of the salmon. And I was like. <laughs> 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 
And she goes, what, what, what? And this is what she said. She goes, she goes is it too salty? I said, <laughs> call back joke, right? But I was like, yeah, it's, it, it's pretty salty. Now, 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 now the reality is she, she couldn't taste and she couldn't smell, so she had no governor on her on how much salt to put in. And, and, and what happens sometimes is that the same is true of isolation. You, you, you know, solitude is a good thing until it's not. Isolation is a good, in, in fact, a huge part of life is knowing when it is, it a, when it is appropriate for, for you to be alone and knowing when it is inappropriate for you to be alone. Because when you are alone with the wrong mind games going on in your head, you will end up with some very destructive results. In, in, in fact, I would even uh, dare say that you have to know, you know when to isolate because the reality is, is that if you're isolating in the wrong times, then your bad thoughts, your mind game thoughts will have no resistance. They'll have no resistance. And so they'll be able to go wherever they wanna go. That's why in part, like our world's going crazy right now because there's these huge world issues going on. And the problem is we haven't been able to hang out and actually discuss some things outside of social media. And so there's no resistance to any of our thoughts. And so we end up with some pretty terrible thoughts because we're just sitting, hanging out with ourselves, with our mind going crazy. And there's no resistance to go, well, but have you thought about this? And have you thought about this? And have you thought about this? We need each other. So now the problem is, is that Elijah goes on by himself when he shouldn't have been alone. See, it says he goes into Beersheba, he's afraid for his life. It says he left his servant in Beersheba. It says, then he went alone in the, into the wilderness, traveling all day, he sat down under a solitary broom tree and he says, take my life. See, you have to know when isolation is a good thing. Because again, isolation is the precursor to terrible thinking, receiving no resistance. I wanna have the team come up, I wanna finish with a couple thoughts, but you know, uh, I've always had this goal that um, I just wanna get better. Anybody else like that? Like you just wanna, I just wanna be better than I was a year ago. I, 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 just wanna, I just wanna be a better person than I was a, a year ago. It's not that I think we earn God's love, I don't think we earn God's love at all, but I just think, man, I just wanna grow. I wanna be, I wanna be humble enough to go, man, I wanna grow, I wanna be better at my craft, I wanna be, I wanna be better in spirit, I wanna be, I just wanna be better than I was a year ago. And, and uh, me and Christina were having a conversation and I was kinda having, you ever have one of those like, woe is me, like pity party table one type of vibe to you, right? And I was kind of having one of those moments like a couple months ago where I'm just going, man, I just wanna be leading better in this season. I wanna be, I wanna be leading better. I, want, I, I wish I'd done this in my leadership and I wish I'd done, done that. And she's like, stop. Christina was like, stop. She's like, like, you know, like they don't teach you how to like go through a world pandemic in Bible college. <laughs> like stop being so hard on yourself. Like we're all learning on the fly, we're, 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 all, we're all learning on the go. And, and you know what I thought in that moment? I went, thank God I wasn't alone right now. Thank God that when I was having one of those moments, I had some resistance. And I had somebody that could tell me, hey, you're not thinking like the way God's probably thinking about you right now. You, you need some resistance. Now the problem, here's, here's the, the dirty little secret. The problem with you and I is sometimes in a weird way, we kind of like those moments. We actually don't want resistance. We actually don't want people telling us, no, you're gonna be okay, no, we're gonna be great. In, in, in fact, I, I call it the tree of isolation. It says that he, that he finds a solitary broom tree and he just gets under it. I wonder what solitary, solitary trees you found yourself under of going, hey, listen, there's a whole group of people that are saying, hey, hey you, you don't have to rest under that tree. You can rest under this tree with us and you make all kinds of excuses. Like, I wonder how many of us in this room have complained about the friends we don't have and haven't texted the 18 friends that we have had back. Come on, I wonder how many of us have been in a situation where we're going, we wouldn't want to admit it because it'd be kind of embarrassing to admit, but sometimes it's like, no, I'm just gonna sit under this tree of isolation even though there'd be a whole group of people saying, oh no, come sit under this tree with us and get rest and get shaded with us. See, Elijah's despair comes from not feeling like he has taken any ground. He says, I'm not any further along than my ancestors. And what happens? No pushback. Like there was nobody to go, wait, hold up. 
really? Like, do you not know what you, what, how God just used you against the prophets of Baal? Like, did you forget that? Come on, you, you need some pushback in your life. And then it goes on to say that he goes and lays down and he sleeps under this broom tree and as he was sleeping, an angel touches him and says, get up and eat. And he looks around and there's bread and there's water and so he eats and then this happens again. I love what the angel says. He says, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. And then it says when he eats, he gets up and the food that he ate gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Can I, can I encourage you? Um, I, I think you gotta get up because there's ground ahead for you to take. Some of you, you've been, you've been under that tree of loneliness and it's just time to get up. I think you came to church today. I think you're watching online today just to hear those words. Man, I, I gotta get up because there's some ground for me to take because here's how God works. God always gives you the meal of grace right when you need it. God always gives you the meal of grace right when when you need it. He'll let you get to the end of yourself because the Bible does remind us that in our weakness, what? He's made strong. So he'll let you get weak. He'll, he'll, he'll let you get to that point, but he'll always give you the meal right on time. I love that Elijah got the meal right when he needed it and that meal carried him to the mountain where he could meet with God face to face. In fact, four and a half years ago, we were getting ready to plan our church. We were getting ready to launch Grace City Church. And... Uh, in fact, it's amazing. This September, we're celebrating five years as a church. September 20th, uh, five years as a church. It's gonna be awesome. And I remember four and a half years ago, like it was yesterday, and it was Saturday night, and we, man, we were putting in carpet squares at our chapel campus, I mean, till like two in the morning, uh, until like church the next day. It was absolutely crazy. And I remember on Saturday night, I got a phone call um, from a friend of mine, and I had all kinds of emotions. Like, like I, 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 I mean, this is not a good thing. I'm not, I'm not um, bragging about this. This is a bad thing. But I'm one of those people, like, I don't think anybody's gonna show up. Every, every Sunday, I don't think anybody's showing up. And like the last 17 weeks, I was right. But like, but before that, <laughs> I told you guys this would happen, right? <laughs> but like, I'm just one of those people who's like, I, I, I just never think people are gonna show up until they're there. And I'm like, oh, this is amazing, you know? And, um, and, uh, and I was thinking the same thing on that Saturday night before our church is getting ready to launch. I quit my job. We leveraged everything to start a church. And I'll never forget, I get a phone call and I, I wasn't able to answer it, but I got a voicemail, a long voicemail from my good friend named Scott Thomas, who pastors Free Life Chapel here in Lakeland. And Scott called me and left a voicemail. This way, he, he said a lot of things. You know, you know, he said, dude, your church is gonna blow up. God's, you know, just, your, your guys' church is gonna be unique and special in our region. It's gonna be absolutely incredible. And I'll never forget this. He, he, he said, and I just want you to know, if you don't have it, it's because you don't need it right now. And if you don't know it, it's because you don't need to know it right now. Uh, God's hand is on your life and God's hand is gonna be on Grace City. And can I tell you, man, when I heard those were like, literally the hair is standing up on the back of my neck right now, just retelling it. When I heard that, if you don't have it, it's because you don't need it right now. And if you don't know it, it's because you don't need to know it right now. Can I tell you, that was bread and water to me in that moment. I went, oh, I'm good for 40 days. I'm good. God gave me exactly what I needed, exactly when I needed it to get to the place that he had for my destiny. The reality is God will never give you an assignment that he has not given you the grace to carry. So we can either complain about our assignment, we can be frustrated about our assignment, we can play our mind games. What if I quit on my assignment? What if I wasn't here on my assignment? Or we can say, you know, God, your grace is sufficient for me. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. And God, if I'm going through it, you're gonna carry me through it. And I'm gonna be okay. And I'm gonna get to the other side. And I'm gonna tell about how God carried me through this. Listen, your assignments will never be bigger than the grace that's on your life. Get the right people around you, get faith people around me. And sometimes you gotta hear the word of God again and again, and it's gonna feel like a cliche. But I don't care if it's a cliche, if it works, if it's effective. Come on, church, let's stand to our feet.